The State of the Classroom is a co-production of the Indiana Department of Education and Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. Students entering our classrooms today are very diverse. Each student brings his or her own language, special talents, cultural upbringing, economic background, health realities, and unique family structures. In Indiana, the state of the classroom is a reflection of our local communities. As a classroom teacher, I have never been able to meet the needs of all children from within the walls of the classroom. Throughout our state, children come to our schools in need of food, clothing, adult and community support. To find the true state of the classroom and in order for our students to flourish academically and develop into productive members of our communities, we must look beyond the school walls and acknowledge the challenges that our students face outside of the classroom. For the next hour, we'll introduce you to courageous young people and you'll meet the school and community advocates working to create positive change in their lives. I have seen many students who whose home lives have really been a burden to their overall success. We have to fill all those voids when our, our students come to us. And so that has to come first. If we don't lay a good foundation, then what we try to teach them when it comes to reading and writing and arithmetic is not gonna matter. We will also be joined by a panel of experts to explore ways to strengthen the connections between educators, volunteers, government agencies, and community services to give all of Indiana's children the quality education they deserve and on which our state's future depends. Ultimately, our goal, we, we want to break those cycles so that, uh, that 20 years from now, we won't be having the same conversation. Success breeds more success, and before you know it, it goes from being an anomaly to becoming the expectation. is a smart, articulate 16-year-old struggling to get past her parents' poor life choices. Last summer, both parents were out of prison and on parole. Annie had hoped to get her dad back in her life, but this hope was short-lived when her dad was arrested for stabbing his father and her mother violated probation by getting drunk while on house arrest. Both parents are expected to return to prison. I haven't lived with my mom and dad for longer than a year ever. My parents don't make the best choices. They have been into a lot of legal trouble. My dad, he's kind of violent. He, um, he's an alcoholic. Um, the alcohol makes it worse. My mom, she's just really into drugs. She, she's just really hooked. When she is clean and when she is with us, she's like the perfect mom. Like she could win an award because she's so loving. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want a moment? Okay. I hate the fact that I've drank and let it control my life and ended up in the position that I'm in. The mistakes I've made have just affected my life, my kids' lives, and you know my parents' lives and everybody's lives around me. She's my pride and joy, <laughs> my firstborn. I mean, it makes me cry just thinking about her, you know? I love her, I miss her. I'm ashamed of what I've made of my life, but I don't know. I just wanna to go to sleep and never wake up sometimes. Being raised in a foster home means the odds are against the child graduating from high school and attending college. 
Foster children have a difficult time connecting with caring adults in their lives. Such is the case with the story of Shelby Mitchell. Growing up, I was adopted at a young age because my mom was on drugs and she gave us up to foster care. I like questioning myself, like, why did my mom have to do this? And um, I just felt like I would, like she abandoned us to pick her, basically pick her drugs over her kids. And then um, I was wondering, like, what happened to my dad? The more that you think about stuff like that, and the longer you think about it, it just become a blur. So you just don't want to think about it no more because you know that you're not never going to get the answer. Shelby's quest to meet her dad came to an abrupt end when she was in middle school. We had got a phone call and um, my mom had told me that my, had, my dad had died. I just wanted to meet him though. So you never met your dad? No. Marlena Woods is a junior at Caston High School, living in a rural farming community. Marlena's parents, from the beginning of her life, were not involved in the raising of their daughter. For the beginning part of my life, I lived with my grandma, because my biological parents both like drugs, I guess you could put it that way. And they thought meth was more important than me and my siblings, so we all lived with our grandma. There would be times where our biological mom would come and take us and just leave us with random people we didn't know. And then Grandma would find out where we were and make her bring us back. Grandma would rescue Marlena and her two siblings many times from unsafe environments. Marlena's biological mom would demand to take them for visits. On one of these visits, Marlena and her older brother experienced their parents being arrested. That's when we kind of knew it was drugs. And then they started making it in front of us. They would cook it. You could smell like chemicals. So we knew what meth was. There'd be times where they'd be like, oh, our friends are coming over. And then they'd lock us in the bedrooms upstairs and do drugs in our living room. After many years of taking care of Marlena and her siblings, in 2006, Marlena's grandmother was killed by a passing automobile in front of Marlena's home. Marlena and her brother ran out of the house to find their one anchor in life dying in front of them. Marlena's path in life had changed forever. Twenty-five years ago, Tiffany Coleman was born into a family that lacked love and empathy, which were replaced by mental and physical abuse. I, I didn't have a normal childhood. Up until a point in my second grade year, I thought that it was normal. My mom would hit me regularly. So I've actually got a couple of places on my head that are still pretty sensitive to this day. That was the environment that I was in. That was had what had become standard, and so I had come to expect it. I was I was a low-income kid coming into a school with a lot of high-income families. Friends that I did make weren't allowed to like come to my house or like play with me because of the area of town that I lived in, and so it was a really kind of hard place for me. I had to write one time about the most influential person in my life, and it was my mom but not because she was a positive role model, but because she showed me everything not to do. 18 years ago and 150 miles north of Indianapolis, David Rozier was born with cerebral palsy in one of Indiana's most impoverished areas. I lived in um, the Laney Projects right across the street from Roosevelt High School. It's one of the worst projects. A lot of gang violence, drug dealing, you know, anything you can name negative, they got it. It's a small apartment, it's just me and my mom. I always struggled because she had to work, 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 work. 
And then by me having me having a disability, she would take care of me. So then that's more struggle because you got to worry about your kid. Then you got to work to provide for your kid. And then you already like a young, you're a young single parent. So it's like it's extra hard. So I would see her struggle. Banding as a family, they accepted David's condition and moved forward in life. David was an A and B student until he was 12. On the brink of being a teenager, his impoverished environment took hold of him. After seeing his friends join gangs, he thought he wanted that life too. They are here getting it. They, they my age, counting 600 hours. If you 12 years old with 600 hours making 600 hours a week, that's good. I mean, if he get it, I'm gonna get it. You know, you got the, you got the gamble, you got the gambling from shooting dice, selling drugs, or you know, still. What did you find yourself doing? All of the above. As Marlena, David, Shelby, Tiffany, and Annie have shown us, children bring their challenges to our classrooms every day. We, parents, grandparents, guardians, educators, religious and community leaders, and organizations ranging from government agencies to child advocate organizations must have a candid conversation about the environments in which our children live. I'm joined in this segment of the program by Ante Johnson, Bill Stanjakavich, Miriam Acevedo Davis, and Sherry Silcox. Are the stories of these young people isolated cases in Indiana, or do they represent the state of the classroom? Bill? Well, Superintendent Rhodes, thank you for bringing attention to this very important issue in education. And in one context, fortunately, their stories are not common. You know, when you think of more than one million students in our public school system alone, if their stories were common, we wouldn't have passage rate on the third grade reading test higher than 90% or a 90% high school graduation rate, or, you know, we're in the top 25% in the country in the percentage of our students who go to post-secondary education. But where their stories are common is when students struggle. Almost always when we see students struggling, they have stories like we just heard. Parents who aren't involved or around, parents who are incarcerated, high rates of substance abuse and domestic violence, and of course, the added challenges of poverty. So in that case, when we do see students who are struggling, certainly the stories of these students are all too common. Auntie. Yes, some of our young people are growing up in food deserts. Uh, they're taking care of their younger sibling while mom or dad is at work. Uh, there are a myriad of challenges that our young people face before they even hit the portals of the school house every day. And so when the teachers uh, then come in contact with these young people, uh, they're facing, you know, the um, attitudes, the uh, poor dispositions, uh, negative, uh, negative reactions. And so a lot of those things play into why our uh, young people um, perform or act out the way they do as a result of the environments that they're being raised in. Miriam? Um, yeah, at La Plaza, we serve the Latino community, and over the past 10 years, we've seen a doubling in the rate of poverty in the Hispanic community here in central Indiana. So we've seen some of the challenges mentioned by the kids on the film. Not all our families experience that, certainly, but we do see the challenges of unemployment, underemployment, homelessness, uh, food insecurity, um, language barriers. So we do see some of those challenges and how it impacts our students when they get ready to go off to school. Sherry? We see a variety of these issues as well, um, the issues that everyone has, has just mentioned, um, in addition to uh, students not going to preschool so they don't can't keep up the, with their with their their um, peers in school um, they get to third grade and they don't know how to read yet or they get to middle school and they just are struggling to get through that's one issue that I can think of that no one mentioned we um, I believe that issues may be more common than we even um, are willing to admit, even for students that come from, from good homes. And often we can't tell what those issues are unless the student is able to form a, um, a strong relationship, a, a good bond with a caring adult in their lives, and really have someone that they can trust to talk to and share with. Well, we are at 48% in the state of Indiana with free and reduced lunch. Uh, we have many of our schools uh, feeding children not only breakfast and lunch, but dinner. Um, so it is, it is an issue with the food desert, as you mentioned. Uh, we also have over 16,000 Indiana students that are homeless, um, which brings their own unique set of issues to the classroom um, in which we must deal. 
What connections do you have with schools and what have you heard from teachers? Bill? Well, the most important ratio in education actually is not the teacher-student ratio, it's the parent-student ratio and that's backed up by the educators who ask us for professional development on how they can better communicate with and involve parents in the classroom. It's also our experience across the state, Madam Superintendent, that schools are very welcoming of community organizations, religious congregations and mentoring programs to walk alongside them to give these students the support that they need. Sherry? Um, yes, and, and we do hear from teachers that they're struggling with the same kinds of issues that, that students are bringing to our programs, which are the mentoring and the after school program in the Michigan City area schools. Um, we're very, very lucky and I think blessed, and I think it has made a big difference that we're so well embedded in the schools because we've seen other programs that offer similar services really struggle with uh, um, academic support and being able to communicate with, with administrators and with teachers um, because of the lack of time maybe, but we're right inside the schools. So every program that we run is in one of the school buildings and we formed a wonderful relationship with, with everyone over the years. It's made a difference. Monte? For us, uh, the teachers are, are always asking and wanting us to expand our program. The challenge becomes with the volunteer, uh, our volunteer pool. So um, we struggle with getting folks to join us and to volunteer their time and pouring back into the lives of young people in the classroom. So um, we have a great partnership with, um, with uh, uh, our schools that we're, we operate in, but the unfortunate part is that we don't have enough volunteers to actually help us uh, support our young people. All right, and Miriam? You know, we're at 18 area middle school and high schools working with teachers, administrators, schools to support Latino students uh, and to engage their parents to be supporters of kids. So we see a real strong relationship with IPS, uh, township schools and others who welcome us into the school as partners uh, to support the great work they're doing with our kids. So. As I said at the beginning of the program, no teacher can meet all the needs of the students within the classroom walls. School and community wraparound services are needed. The next segment of our program will focus on the services and programs that can make a critical difference in helping young people overcome the challenges. Throughout Indiana, students come to our schools with their unique needs. So what about the child whose home life affects their ability to learn in the classroom? Many times the educators in our schools are the only caring adults in a child's life. How can the communities of Indiana help these children? The answer seems to lie in Indiana's diverse resources of wraparound services. This is my 42nd year as an educator, and I can certainly attest to the fact that I have seen many students who, whose home lives have really been a burden to their overall success. It is so true that when they're worried about who might be at home or who might not be at home or are the police going to knock on my door tonight or what am I going to eat and nobody's asking them what homework they have in their folder, nobody's asking them what they did at school, they're not worried about their folder, they're not worried about what homework they have because they have too many other things to survive that they're worried about. We see it every day, and as an elementary principal, much of the discipline that I dealt with was that exact situation where kids are bringing stress from home, something that happened prior to them ever stepping foot in the school doors, but yet it impacts that child's day. Many of the problems we deal with are not problems that were created or happened at school. They're problems that come into the school that we end up you know, trying to do the best job that we can in helping that child work through that. The teachers can't do it all. They need the support of counselors and wraparound services to try to, to bridge those gaps. And ultimately our goal, we, we want to break those cycles so that, a, a, that 20 years from now we won't be having the same conversation. These are children who really want to learn. They have the capacity to be successful, but it certainly requires some added assistance in order to enable them to accomplish their goals. And that's why these community partnerships 
are so critical that we work together with our schools to, um, because no one entity can meet all of these needs. I define a wraparound service as whatever is needed to ensure that a student is able to reach his or her potential. In some cases, it may be academic. In some cases, it may be enrichment. In some cases, it may be basic need. So not all families are able to provide equal supports for their kids. Some families are struggling with they're working several jobs or they're struggling with substance abuse. Whether it's hunger or education or tutoring or mentoring or mental health services, we can assist in making sure that families get those things. To put our arms around that child and ensure that whatever a child needs or a group of children need, we are giving that to them or directing them to that, directing the families in that direction so that that child can have the best opportunity to succeed in life. We provide them with a consistent environment with caring adults and we provide programs and activities that help them think about their future, give them uh, foundations for self-esteem, building positive relationships not only with each other but with caring adults. And these are the foundations that we think can build into leading them into self-sufficient lives where they become caring adults in their community. There is a lot of hands-on project-based learning that takes place. We have a lot of enrichment teachers. Some of them are students at our local university and or retired individuals that come back and share their expertise with our students. So it is quality education, but it's done in a different format. It's done more project-based, hands-on. We offer a huge variety of after-school opportunities for them to be able to, to put a light bulb off in their head and say, wow, I have a passion for that. If we see it, and it is something that could benefit our students, we do it. One of the challenges, I think, for the after-school programs themselves is just um, sustained funding. It's very patchworky, so they may have, you know, local dollars, a little bit of state dollars, a little bit of federal dollars, um, but it's inconsistent, and I think that access to programs is inconsistent across the state. Rural areas have a lot of challenges. One is um, there's long distances between places. It's hard for parents to, to get their kids there and home. The other is they may not have local um, investors. So like in Indianapolis, you have big corporations. You have Lilly, you have Roche, you have Cummins, you have, you know, you have all these big players that can invest. In a rural community, you might just have a local hardware store, or, you know, smaller dollars to invest and contribute. These organizations look at that as they're the most bang for their buck. And uh, you go downtown Indy compared to downtown Tell City, you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck going downtown Indy. The bottom line is we need more resources and, and, and ultimately that takes, that takes money. Quite honestly, you know that there's some communities in the state of Indiana that are thriving. The level of income is much higher and consistent compared to some of maybe the northwest Indiana uh, communities uh, where there's, there's more of these wraparound programs needed. Poverty has its own set of challenges separate and apart uh, from being a young person that requires educators to work that much harder and to understand even greater the sociology that is related to poverty. This district is a high poverty district. We're beyond 80% free and reduced lunch. I think the, the biggest challenge to working in a high poverty district is not so much the challenges that come from the district, that come from the politicians and the people that make their laws and make the rules that we have to abide by because they don't listen to us, they don't come and visit, and they don't see what it takes on a day-to-day basis. We know that we have parents that are alcoholics, we know that we have many parents that are incarcerated, we have several broken homes, and so we have to fill all those voids when our, our students come to us. And so that has to come first. If we don't lay a good foundation, then what we try to teach them when it comes to reading and writing and arithmetic is not gonna matter.
In Indiana, there are over 62,000 public school teachers to serve over 1 million students. I travel two to three days per week around the state visiting community leaders, organizations, and schools. I see awesome teaching and learning. Indiana can be proud of its teaching force and education leaders. I also get to meet outstanding adults in our community who provide the wraparound services for our children. I'm joined today by Pat Sims, Rachel Wright, Sherry Silcox, and Elizabeth Odell. Let's explore more about the state of the classroom and talk about how we might be able to improve our K-12 uh, system for our children. I think we need to um, invite the community to come into the schools and help as much as they can. I think we also need to find a better way to educate our educators on what's available in each community because we're all different and we there are different services that are available everywhere. If they don't know what's available and they see a child with a problem, then they, there's no way that they can make that phone call or connect that child. So yeah, I want to mention a little bit, and we can just continue the conversation about you know our emphasis now in the state of Indiana on pre-K. Um, and so our public schools are working very hard with that, and I know that's an emphasis that we have statewide another wraparound service, even earlier for our children as, as we're seeing the need. Um, I'm always a, a vocal person uh, regarding the, the learning atmosphere that we have in our classroom. Um, as a state leader, I'd like to see less testing emphasis uh, in, the, in what we do in our classrooms and more inquiry-based and, and really getting with individual students to see how their learning, learning is occurring. Um, and I want to make sure that we're attracting and retaining high-quality educators, uh, making sure we have good systems in place to do that. Uh, so what are your thoughts? Um, um, about uh, K-12 system and improving, improving? Well, I think the other part about it is to make sure that our classrooms have what we call extensions for our students to actually anchor in their learning experiences. Oftentimes, um, the classrooms are really kind of crowded in some cases, and students don't have the opportunity, and teachers don't really have all of the opportunities to make sure that the learning becomes um, just really focus and so when you have out-of-school time providers as well as experiences that kind of deepens and enriches the experiences from the classroom setting so programs that can be in the schools when she talked about making sure that teachers know about services that are available to our students because many times students come from a variety of background experiences and we need to make sure that those experiences are level so to speak some do not have uh, as many experiences that would best prepare them for the classroom. And so it would be helpful if we can make sure that those things happen, happen and then it also helps the classroom teacher as well. Great comments. Uh, in addition to having the uh, teachers be aware of whatever what's available in the community, I think even the students need to know what's mm -hmm. available in mm -hmm. the community. They often don't realize the uh, opportunities and the services that they can access in the community. So I think that would be another way of helping those students. I think to extend on your idea of pre-K programming, we need services for parents, particularly new parents, on how critical it is for your toddler to start their learning process right at home. So even before the pre-K years start, uh, the toddler years are critical so that they have a strong foundation heading into pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade eventually, because as we know, by third grade, if they don't have certain skills, the rest of their school time is really gonna be a challenge for them. So I hear a little common theme here about making sure that everyone knows how to access services. Right. Um, and the teacher should be knowledgeable also about what kind of services are available in the school principal and making sure that that happens. Um, I know there's been a, a groundswell of more business involvement uh, in partnerships with schools, um, career development, learning, uh, service learning, tutoring, mentoring, um, health services, mental health services. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about uh, perhaps what group you work with and, and how we can uh, really break the cycle of a, this 22% poverty that we have in the state of Indiana with our children. For us, uh, with Boys and Girls Clubs in Northwest Indiana, we partner with not only our partner agencies, but with local businesses like ArcelorMittal in supporting our programs that will allow them to hire those students in the future. So if they have really good educational foundations and begin to have emotional structure and foundation, then these will be the employees of those businesses, or better yet, these will be the entrepreneurs 
for our communities to build businesses within uh, the Northwest Indiana area. Okay, Sherry? As we have added programs, we've noticed that we've been able to invite different groups into the schools. Our first robotics program has allowed us to visit businesses and to invite them to come in and help, um, as, where we didn't know how to do that before necessarily. And also our horticulture program has allowed us to, to invite people that enjoy gardening or master gardeners to come in and work with our students. Um, so that's been an invitation. Do you want to add to that? Okay. Well, with our partnership, Bridges to Success is a longtime partnership with the Indianapolis Public Schools and United Way. And it, it is our position to place school community coordinators at, at those schools that we work with and to make sure those coordinators are well versed on opportunities, services, resources that are available to our students and to the families. We have to remember that not only what impacts that student happens many times outside of the classroom and so it's the responsibility for us to engage community partners such as the Boys and Girls Club, others that happen even before, during and after school. Businesses want to come in and help and, it's, and it is sometimes awesome for an administrator to engage all those services so having a co coordinator to do that is also a part of what makes a difference. Okay, you want to follow up? Well, with four communities in schools, we actually position that site coordinator in the schools that creates a relationship with the student uh, to find out what their both their academic and non-academic needs may be, and then find those resources, coordinate those resources in the school to help that student be as successful as they can. When the community, families, and volunteers join forces with educators, the results can be remarkable. We're going to check back with Annie, Shelby, Marlena, Tiffany, and David to see how they're doing. After the passing of Marlena's grandma, she bounced from foster homes to friends to basically whoever would take her, never finding a permanent place to stay. This went on for six long years. But in 2013, her life would change. My first encounter with Marlena was the day that she enrolled at Caston. And I just happened to be in the office when she enrolled. And so I made it a point to say hi to her. Our relationship built from there. And the more she spent time with me, the more she shared kind of what was going on in her life. Paige had brought him to talk to me about me coming to live with them. Like we had never met before and for just someone to come and meet someone, like a teenager, to come and live with them, I mean to me that's amazing. Like you don't find many people who are just going to bring someone in their home just out of the kindness of their heart. Our lawyer attempted to get um, consent for legal guardianship from both Marlena's biological mother and her biological father and was not able to get consent from either one of them. Paige and Chip decided to go to court to have Marlena's fate decided. And on March 18th, 2013, Paige and Chip Woodhouse were given permanent custody of Marlena. We went to Rochester to the courthouse, um, separate vehicles, separate people, separate stories, um, but that day we left together as a family. We are new to the whole parenting thing, but at the same point, really, Marlena is new to having a parent and having a consistent adult who is there to care about her. Having a good home life definitely helps because then like you can go to school and you know where you're going at night, like you know you're gonna go home and you're gonna have a family. So it's easier to focus because you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. Growing up in a foster home, Shelby Mitchell had challenges most people will never face. Fortunately, Shelby met Mullen Elementary coach Sherry Wagner. The first time I met Shelby, she seemed a little angry, just overwhelmed and stressed out. I just felt like she was somebody that maybe needed 
a little extra attention or maybe needed a friend, somebody she could confide in and talk about maybe what was bothering her and what was going on in her life. I used to be real involved in sports and she used to be the coach. If I have an attitude in class, then the, <laughs> then the teacher will go down there and tell her because she know that I really wanted to be playing basketball, but grades have to maintain. So she'll have me doing my homework at practice. I just tried to let her know that I was gonna be there for her, that I wanted to not just be her coach, but I wanted to help her know that she could have the power to make good choices in her life. At age nine, Shelby was introduced to Safe Harbor, a local wraparound service that offered a mentoring program called Hours for Hours. We are part of the school district as Safe Harbor and Hours for Hours. We are a, a separate program, but we're also very, very connected with the schools. We recognize that the work that we do with our students during regular school hours is limited. And it's really important to extend the boundaries of our day, our school day. And so we work hand in hand with Safe Harbor, first of all, to ensure they're aware of the curriculum that we're following. They understand what some of our student needs are academically. Hours for Hours is a part of Safe Harbor. I don't know where many of our students would be if it were not for that particular program. I guess it's the encouragement that I got, the support that I got, the resources that was referred to me, that extra attention, somebody having faith in me. It is hard getting out to bed sometime when you got class at 8 o'clock in the morning. We all know it's hard getting out of bed, but I do it and um, because I know at the end of the day it's going to pay off. On the eve of her 15th birthday, Tiffany Coleman reached her breaking point with the mental and physical abuse, and she left her home. After successfully living on her own for a few months, the Department of Child Services was alerted and required her to move in with some relatives. There, she focused on her studies and moved forward with her life. She also realized how her acceptance into the 21st Century Scholar Program would change her life's potential. When we got that 21st Century Scholarship, I didn't even and like fully understand, but it was some money for school for me at that point. And so that really made it feel like college moved from this idea to an actual possibility. The 21st Century Scholars Program is Indiana's Early Promise Scholarship Program. It's been around since 1990. It's a scholarship, but it's really designed to be a preparation program as well to help make sure that students can not only afford college, but they are equipped to actually succeed in college once they get there. Tiffany's life was moving forward as she started her sophomore year at IU. But she knew she also had to save her younger brother and her sister from a life of abuse. Tiffany and her new husband, Chris, petitioned the courts to gain guardianship of her siblings. After many setbacks, they were awarded custody at the same time she was pregnant with their first child. We went from my husband and I and this little puggle to a family of five in a year. In her junior year of college, she was accepted into IU's Maurer School of Law. Upon graduating college, she understood how much the 21st Century Scholar Program had saved her. When I graduated, it was somewhere between, somewhere around $22,000, $23,000 that they were paying a year between the university and in the state, and everything was covered for me. So I got out of college without any debt, no debt at all. If we do our jobs right, there will never be a second generation 21st century scholar because what can happen in terms of a family that had not had a tradition of going to college and they have that first success story and that success breeds more success. And before you know it, it goes from, become, from being an anomaly to becoming the expectation. And college is a possibility for them. They can afford college if they're willing to work for it. And Indiana is gonna do what it can to make sure the resources and the support are there to make that possible. I found out about the Boys and Girls Club through a couple of my friends. They would always say like, 
They, you wanted the club? Like the club club. They would say like it's the club club. I mean, like you go to the club, you're like 10 years old. What are you talking about? So I was like, I beg, I beg my mom and girl, like, mom, can I go? Can I go? Can I go? Can I go? And she got tired of me saying, uh, can I go? Can I go? So she finally let me go. David's been coming to the club for nine years. He's faced many struggles with throughout his life. He's been faced with drugs and gangs and violence. It, it comes to a point where you do something wrong so many times, you're like, is this it? Is this the only purpose of life? But then when you go around positive people, you're like, oh, it's something different about them. It's some I can't put my, put my finger on it. Something different about them. When I walked in the Boys and Girls Club and I seen all these kids carefree and safe around these loving people that, that really don't even know them, but they care for these kids. That's like, wow, I need to, I need to get them there. I need to get them there playing. I need to, I need to do what they're doing, man. I, I like this. This feeling is, is for me, man. He's definitely at a crossroads. I believe at the start of his senior year, he had 22 credits, which is about half of what we require. We require 42 to graduate. I have spoken with mom. She's very involved and, and is very dedicated in trying to make sure that David is staying on top of things, that he's gonna graduate. I think he knows that the end of high school is approaching and he wants to be um, going across that stage with a, that, that full diploma in hand with the rest of his classmates. Do we think that he's ready to go out and be on his own and live in a home on his own and raise a family? And Well, he has made great stri strides towards being a better person and making the right decisions. He still needs that guidance and mentorship that his mom and the club can provide for him. Probably, I'd say, within a few years, could he make the right decisions? Absolutely. But I think he still has a little bit of training and learning to go within the real world before he can go out on his own. My dream it's time on talk show, but I, I, if that doesn't work out, I'm gonna be a motivational speaker because I don't want kids, either kids regular or kids with disabilities, but everybody's regular, but anybody in general, any kid, any person, to go, go through what I went through. If I see a kid doing the same thing I was doing, I should tell them, don't do that. Like if, like if there's a hole right there and we're walking down the street and you see the hole, but I don't see the hole, and you let me fall, how would that make you feel? We've helped him, I think, become a better person He's told us, actually, in a way, when he first started coming to the club, he thought, oh, it was a boring place. But then what he learned was that it's a place that could save him. Sometimes when I'm in the classroom or at school, just walking around the hallways, I'm reminded about my mom or my dad. Pretty much everyone knows about them and about the choices they've made. Sometimes I'll be in class and it'll cross my mind or someone will say something. And it does affect me. Um, okay, I try not to let it show. Um, When I'm doing schoolwork, it's kind of a downtime, so I have a lot of thinking to do. I do think a lot about my mom and dad, but I try not to let it affect me academically because I want to do better for myself and for my siblings to set a good example. I have to do well in school. I cannot just dwell on everything that's happened. Perry County is a rural community. According to IndianaAfterSchool.org database, Marion County has 160 after-school-based programs. Perry County has five. Perry Central tries to make up for that gap by offering wraparound community services at the school. Perry Central is the hub of the community. There is, not only is there very few agencies, treatment centers and the like in Perry County, but uh, it's hard for the people of our area to get to them. So Perry Central has tried to bring those agencies here. 
as a school, because of our limited resources, we, we feel like we need to fill those gaps. Right now we have two full-time social workers. We wish we could provide more because the need is there. We can't just stop with what we do from that little bit of education from eight to three. We have to go so much beyond that to provide social workers and outreach to families. From what my parents did, it's taken me and made me a better person. Seeing what my parents did has shown me what I don't want to be. We know that schools cannot prepare our students alone. Family and community involvement is paramount in nurturing each child. It is heartwarming to see the children in this program gain that sense of pride and confidence in their lives because of the great partnerships between schools and community. Our final panel with Pat Sims, Rachel Wright, Ante Johnson, and Debbie Zipes will discuss how we can build more partnerships and bring more of these resources into the lives of our children, no matter where they live in Indiana. And let's just start right there. What can we do to make sure that we have more resources in the state of Indiana? Debbie, let's start with you. Well, I think at the local level, building relationships, looking at what are the assets in the community, whether it's the library, the museum, the school, the university, the um, faith-based community, um, building alliances and relationships with them, looking at the parents of, of, of the kids in, in your schools and after-school programs and what are the expertise and resources that they have to contribute and tapping into that and bringing them into your school, into your um, after-school and summer programs. So important to build those relationships. Ante, mm -hmm. what can you add to that? Yeah, so uh, we at 100 Black Men also believe that in order for us to have the collective impact in our community, it's gonna take all of us working together, uh, no matter what the agency or no matter what your um, focus is it within, uh, within the community. I think it's important for all of us to uh, come together and grapple with all of these issues uh, so that we can uh, make a more productive uh, future for our young people. And Pat, what, what would you like to add to that? Certainly building relationships is a huge part of uh, making sure that this is available to everyone across the state. But I also think making sure that we find out exactly what the schools need. What are the needs? What are the things that will help those students uh, in that school? What specific things? And finding those resources and making sure we bring those in as well. Yeah, we gotta have this conversation everywhere. And so yes. Rachel, what, how would you uh, work with that to make sure that the conversation is gonna continue with the schools and the partnerships? The community has many uh, adults, caring adults in the community that need to be involved with all of the children that we serve because a caring adult in a child's life can make the difference between a child achieving and a child falling by the wayside. So we have an equity uh, issue and we want to be sure we get services all over the state of Indiana to be sure we have those wraparound services for each child. So let's talk a little bit about funding. Uh, what kind of funding sources uh, do you rely upon and, and where do you see funding as being a primary kind of piece to make sure that kids do get services? So there's funding in all different kinds of places. So there's federal funding, there's state level funding, and there's funding in local communities. Businesses can be phenomenal partners and assets, both in contributing um, volunteers and mentors, as well as financial resources. Um, so um, in addition, um, as um, you mentioned over here, that um, the community, um, so individuals and um, parents and others that really care about the kids in the community are also potential investors. What type of, type of investors does 100 mm. Black Men uh, use? So we have uh, members that uh, have skin in the game and play a very uh, important role in the uh, prospering of our young people. Uh, we also couldn't do what we do without uh, our local funders. Uh, but you know, as, as we all know, uh, during this, this day and age, is critical and dollars are shrinking and so we have to really think um, and be creative on how we um, utilize dollars or even go after dollars so um, that's a challenge but uh, it's a challenge that uh, we're up for and uh, we've had some success and we're you know we're grateful for our uh, sponsors and funders uh, in the community. In the Boys and Girls Club? 
<coughs> we, of course, as everyone else, we use federal funding, local funding, corporate funding. Uh, we also are a United Way agency, so we do receive monies that way. But we feel that tapping into the individual contributor by telling our story and making sure we're able to communicate our impacts and our outcomes to, our, to that community so that they will want to contribute to the services that we provide to the children of the community. And Pat, uh, you uh, work for an organization called Communities in Schools. So how does that group uh, get its funding and, and uh, talk to us a little bit about your right in the school? Yes, we are. We're, we have a, a very strong partnership directly in the schools. Uh, we have the same kinds of funding, corporate, uh, local funding. But even beyond that, what seems to be an important piece is building sustainability from the very beginning of the funding and creating uh, those partnerships that can help build the program or sustain the program beyond the life of the grant. As we close, I want to extend my sincerest thanks to the panel members and to everyone who participated in our documentary. As we've seen, the state of the classroom is as complex as the children entering our doors. But as Perry Central's Mary Roberson said, we want to break the cycle so that 20 years from now, we won't be having the same conversation. Education attainment can be an equalizer in economic disparity, but supports must be in place to empower our children to succeed. To those who are already actively engaged with our children, thank you. To those watching who would like to be more involved, well, there is no time like the present. This is a call to action to work together for Indiana's children. There are no students that are um, immune to having difficulties in their lives. I don't care where they live. They could live in a big city, inner city. They can live in a rural area. They can live anywhere in the state. Um, we just see these problems come, come at us from all walks of life. My parents, in my instance, were an integral part of my educational experience. Our neighbors were. Uh, my church members were. The community now is not as involved in the educational experience, and that puts a greater burden on teachers and principals and school administrators. If there's ever a, a kid that your heart just breaks for, or a situation where you feel like, you know, what can I do there? Explore your options. You have to be willing to take that first step to say, I want to reach out to them. I would ask individuals, adults, and even uh, teenagers just to volunteer. Pick an organization that suits your sensibilities, whether it's the food bank, or boys and girls clubs, or big brothers, big sisters, or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Volunteer in your community with those agencies because at the end of the day, it's about communities coming together to provide for other community members. And if we don't take the time to give back to our children and ensure that they're able to meet their potential and be successful in life, then they're gonna be the ones causing the problems within the community. They're gonna be the ones in need of supplemental resources in order to live. And they're gonna be the ones that we have to rely on to take care of us in the future. Probably the most difficult part is is, is getting the community to buy in as far as mentoring. We could mentor so many more students than what we have the ability to mentor just because we have a hard time getting people to come out and spend an hour a week with a student. Many people don't have financial resources, but everyone has time. Get involved, please get involved. Spend an hour a week with, with students. There are mentoring programs that are wonderful all over the state. Everybody knows how to do something. Can you crochet? Go in and help some students crochet. Do you play chess? Go help students play chess. Could you help them with math? Could you read to them? Could you just be involved? Could you just be an ear to listen to? Could you be a friend? Please get involved. The State of the Classroom 
is a co-production of the Indiana Department of Education and Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations.